Um, so a little bit more about me. I was uh, born and raised in Pendleton, Oregon, and then I left the area for about 30 years, and then I came back to Pendleton, and, and when I was gone, I was involved in civic activities in, in uh, other cities that I lived in, especially on the west side, Gresham, Oregon, and when I came back to Pendleton, and I always wanted to because of growing up in Pendleton, um, left while I was in high school, because of my um, dad had to transfer with his job, um, I always wanted to come back. And I came back to Pendleton now um, close to uh, 20 years ago. I actually live in Athena, Oregon now. So, And then during the time I was gone, as many people do, I was active as a volunteer for the Pendleton Roundup. And then when I came back, became more active, and then ended up on the board of directors for the Pendleton Roundup. And then right after that, served my eight years on the board of directors for the Pendleton Roundup and Happy Canyon Hall of Fame. I'm generally still active. I, did, I left the board last year, generally still active as a pseudo archivist for um, the Pendleton Roundup and Happy Canyon. So I, I think that's why I got my arm twisted to, to come and do this presentation. I'm not quite as formal if, if some of you were here a month ago for Becky Wagner's presentation. Um, Becky put in a lot of effort to write her book about the Happy Canyon. So, and because of her longtime family connection to the Happy Canyon, so, um, if she and I were to sit down and, and do a dueling conversation about what do you know about Roundup and what do you know about Happy Canyon, she'd win. <laughs> and then I'm just going to offer that, um, so what I'm trying to say is I'm not necessarily an expert, but I, but I try to know the history of the Pendleton Roundup as best I can. But if I stumble today, this guy si sitting right here snuck in here just to keep, keep me on point. Matt um, was on the Happy Canyon Board of Directors, and Matt was on the Hall of F Pendleton Roundup and Happy Canyon Hall of Fame Board of Directors as well. So he, he kind of knows what I'm talking about, and if I stumble, he's going to correct me and that's okay. Maybe together we might be experts, I'm not quite sure. So with that, um, I, I did, I passed you out a little, the, I, I don't know if you had a chance to look at it, but the little handout, I actually um, twisted a gentleman's arm, um, and I'll mention him again at the end of the presentation. His name is Vic Casera, and he is a Pendleton resident um, no longer, but was, went to high school and grew up in Pendleton, and he wrote a book called The Rivoli, and it, there is a theater in Pendleton um, that they're trying to renovate that was the Rivoli Theater, and his book that he did was the, um, talks about um, theaters, opera houses, and that, the history of them in, in Pendleton, and with that, his book became kind of a history of Pendleton itself. And so I went to a presentation he did with regards to his book, and he had these, and I twisted his arm to then, because he did have some information about the Pendleton Roundup, and twisted his arm to let me bring these to you. That's actually an excerpt out of the East Oregonian um, newspaper in Pendleton from 1910. Um, the first year of the Roundup, July 29th, but I thought it, it could give you a flavor of a little bit about what Pendleton and the Roundup is all about. So with that, um, I, I titled it Shaped by Forward Thinking Community Members and Events, and I really do think from the standpoint of Pendleton, um, there are some things that uh, that many folks do not know. There is a, dis 
there is a, a statement that's made or a, a view that's passed along is that in 1909, there was a 4th of July event that was similar to a rodeo. And because of that, then all of a sudden, that was the catalyst for the Pendleton Roundup and of coming around in 1910. But there's some other things that happened in Pendleton that um, many believed helped drive the need for something like the Pendleton Roundup. There was a flood in Pendleton in 1906 that was pretty devastating to the city. Um, nationwide, there was the panic similar to that of the Great Depression. There was the panic, financial panic of 1907. And then um, the Pendleton Woolen Mills, as it's known now, closed in 1907. There was a mill there, and it closed in 1907, and um, was a um, employer of a large number of people in Pendleton. And the most, one of the things that a lot of people think caused the real thinking for the Pendleton Roundup is in 1908, Umatilla County, where Pendleton is located, um, was voted dry. And so just the county was dry, not the state, because the state didn't um, become dry until 1916. So when it was voted dry, there were 30 plus saloons and 10 plus brothels in Pendleton. And when it went dry, they went dry. And the economic impact, if you read back in the history of Pendleton, was, was pretty severe. They, they increased taxes to try to be able to take care of the people of Pendleton because there was no income coming in for the businesses that, the, that usually paid those taxes. So um, it, it was this was considered maybe even as great or equal catalyst to not only trying to preserve the Western way of life, but also preserve Pendleton. Because um, it was considered, the, t the city was considered like, um, uh, you don't see this term used because Las Vegas wasn't what it, it was then, but it could be considered like the Las Vegas of the Eastern Washington, Eastern Oregon, because people would come from all over to play in Pendleton. And those 30 saloons, if you've ever been to Pendleton, um, there is a map that shows them they were essentially all on Main Street, as you know Pendleton today. So it was in one door, out the other door, in the door, and out the door. One comment I'd make, and I'm going to try to weave this in a little bit with regards to just Walla Walla itself, one of the other things that's interesting about reading about Pendleton growing dry is Walla Walla wasn't dry. Walla Walla County wasn't dry. So it, it was thought that there was a lot of bootlegging going on between the two cities, that there was a relationship there. And there's even discussions. I've never seen anything factual to show up, but that um, the farms between Walla Walla and Pendleton and the barns became hiding places for vehicles and wagons that were hauling booze to Pendleton. In, in 1910, um, the county voted to return to being wet, but it was, um, they created an ordinance and only 12 saloons were al allowed. So about the time Roundup was created, then there were saloons allowed again. And then, of course, just to fill in the whole prohibition history, Pendle, I mean, Oregon went dry in 1916, and then the nation was dry in 19, from 1920 to 1933. And I think, personally, dates like this are important um, with regards to um, sharing you, with you the history of um, the Pendleton Roundup. And basically what I'm doing is we, we created at the Pendleton Roundup and Happy Canyon Hall of Fame. Yes, sir. Of the 30 saloons that were closed, and then there were 12 that were allowed to reopen, did they reopen? Were the 12 part of the 30, or were they kept 
No, some of them were the same. I can't be explicit with you on who was allowed to come back in, but some were the same. By example, it wasn't named this now, maybe Matt can help me, but if you've ever been to Pendleton on Main Street, the Rainbow Cafe is considered by some to be the oldest bar in Oregon. Continuously operated. So there would be one that would have, but it was under a different name. I'm going to say it was like the Oregon Bar or something like it. It was a strange name. Continuously operated, operated even during Prohibition. Sure, because they didn't serve alcohol, supposedly. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll just weave that in. If you haven't done it, the Pendleton Underground Tour, okay, people are shaking their heads, will make that connection where, in fact, um, they are just a portion, and they, they do it in their historical review of the underground when you do the tour, but you've got to remember the underground stretched basically from the railroad tracks on the south end of Main Street all the way to the river on the north end. So however many blocks that is, 10 or so blocks of underground tunnels that were used for various things during various parts of history. So, the Northwestern Frontier Exhibition Association was formed in 1910, and they had a budget of $2,860, and they sold memberships to that association for $10 to, to raise the $5,000 to put on the first Pendleton Roundup. And um, I, I, as we go through the timeline, this will make more sense, but... Um, on that date, September 29th, 1910, when the first roundup was held, they had over 7,000 plus people come to the roundup. And um, that's all they could squeeze into the location that they were holding the roundup, which is generally the same place where the roundup grounds is located now. But it was not owned by the association entity itself. It then became purchased, I think, in 1911 or 1912, and the Roundup has been essentially at that same location for all of its 113 year, well, the 113th year will be this year. And, and they turned so many people away that overnight they added bleachers to seat another 3,000 people. And, and, and I'm trying to key in on some stuff here as we go through, so... Just kind of keep that in mind. Um, the tribes participate, participated in that first year. Um, the Indian village, um, the teepees um, was, happened that first year. And the tribes were a little bit concerned about coming, the confederated tribes of the Umatilla, because they thought they were being set up. Come to town, come to Roundup. Um, and there was concern on their part, so one of the traditions that still stays with the Pendleton Roundup is that they were offered provisions, food, to come to the Roundup, and that's what helped entice them to come. come. There were a couple of main characters. Um, one of the Bishop brothers was very active in convincing the tribes to come, and so was Roy Rayleigh, and if you were at the Happy Canyon presentation by, by Becky, you know that Roy Rayleigh had his hands into both the Pendleton Roundup and the Happy Canyon uh, as um, wanting civic events. And so he was, he was a strong influencer, too, to bring the tribes. To this date, the tribes, the members of the tribes that have teepees in the teepee village are provided with provisions. Um, from any meat, and um, vegetables and fruit. And, they, and the Roundup works to find that for folks for donation to, to, so that the tribal members can have those provisions. One of the other things that happened in 1910 was the Westward Ho Parade. And it's not like it is now because the Westward Ho Parade was meant exactly what it was. The Vidoc that goes down into Pendleton 
essentially that's where the parade would start and it would go west to the roundup grounds and disband inside the roundup grounds after they did a serpentine. It isn't the half circle that the Westward Ho Parade makes now. And that's in, in a sense is what generated its name along with the fact that the tribes joined in in that parade um, to the roundup grounds from the west. Um, I, just, I just know this to kind of give you a history because Pendleton Roundup, I, I refuse to say it most of the time, is not a rodeo in my view. It is the Pendleton Roundup. In the, in the first years, of course, there were all kinds of events that were not, I guess, what I'd call sanctioned. It was what they created. They had, they had bucking contests. They'd, they'd buck buffalo. They'd buck steers. They had races. They had trick riders. They had all kinds of things. But as the progression went, and you ended up with now what are the two organizations that support the professional cowboy and cowgirl, the the Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association and the Women's Professional Rodeo Association, um, here's, here's essentially how those events became official in the eyes of the Pendleton Roundup and records were kept for who did what. So saddle bronc in 1910, bulldogging in 1911, steer roping in 1911, Calf roping, 1927, bull riding, 1944, team roping, 1991, bareback riding as a rough stock event, 1948, women, ladies barrel racing, 1962, and then returns in 2000 under the Women's Professional Rodeo Association, and then breakaway in 2017. In, in offering this, I have a, I have a, familial connection to Walla Walla. And I was, I was thinking about doing this presentation, I wanted to weave in some things for you with regards to um, Walla Walla. Some of you may know, some of you may not know the name Clova and Charmaine Beck. They are my um, mother-in-law, both have passed away, but they are my mother-in-law and father-in-law. And Charmaine Beck, and in our house, we actually, I have a trophy that she won at the Pendleton Roundup, winning the women's barrel race in 1962. Um, another, there were others, and I looked, and I, I've forgotten the name, but the Curcios, that, okay? They're, they also, uh, Judy, and I, and I can't remember which other Curcio actually participated in those years in the, Barbara, yep, participated in women's barrel racing. Then they had uh, poles, too, that they participated in. And they're, in 62, you can find those ladies' names in the actual Pendleton Roundup program. Daisy. Oh, it did. Thank you. I knew that was going to happen. I fling my arms too much. Thank you. And then just as an interesting thing, uh, I, I threw this in. So he, he was a part, Clarence Darrow, who you all know, I hope, discussion about evolution and the whole, the whole thing. Well, he actually spoke in Pendleton in October of 1910 in support of home rule, which then led to the vote for Pendleton to go back to wet. And so there's a little, there's a kind of a national historical figure that, that came to Pendleton to support some of the things in Pendleton. So that was the year it was born. And then I, and then I just kind of picked some certain things out of the timeline for the Pendleton Roundup over the years that um, helped shape it. And some of it, again, was events, something like... Um, going, the, the county becoming dry in um, 1908, or, um, and then just some of the things that I actually believe that the Pendleton Roundup had, um, and, and the association that was created to, to put it on, actually had, were forward-thinking people. 
I mean, I really think that there was an intent to generate uh, economic livelihood for the city of Pendleton. But there are some other things that just events that um, helped shape the Pendleton Roundup. Um, 1911 was the famous bucking horse contest. You may know it by Ken Kesey's book, The Last Go-Round, if you've read it. And, and it was a bucking contest between three individuals, Jackson Sundown, George Fletcher, and John Spain. Jackson Sundown, and, uh, and I hope I don't offend anybody by saying Indian, but that's just the way we still, they still call it the Happy Canyon Indian pageant in some cases. So in Pendleton, it's con considered a socially acceptable term. So Jackson Sundown, tribal member Indian, George Fletcher, black gentleman that grew up in the Pendleton area and um, be, be lived on the Umatilla Indian Reservation and became a great horseman because of his association with tribal members. And then John Spain, and the Spain family's from uh, essentially the Joseph Enterprise area. And those three gentlemen had that bucking contest. Um, and they, they qualified for the finals, if you'll call it. And, and in the finals, it was judged, and actually George, I believe, had to ride two horses. And in that contest, John Spain was chosen by the judges as the winner. And the crowd didn't agree with them. And they took, and, and in part, Till Taylor, as, I, as the history is stated, got a hold of um, George's hat, and they tore it up in little pieces and sold each piece. Um, I've heard $50, I've heard less than that, and it might have been that it was just sold for whatever somebody had in their pocket. They raised enough money to have George Fletcher, he, they had him made a Hamley saddle that looked just like the trophy saddle that John Spain won. So the, the crowd thought that was a good thing. Now, I don't know if Matt knows this, but I'll give you a little bit more of a story. One of John Spain's relatives from the Enterprise area came to the Hall of Fame here about, and I was working in the lobby actually, I'd say within the last year and a half, and walked in and said, hey, I understand you have a, a saddle a cantle a plaque or piece of silver regarding John Spain's championship saddle in the Hall of Fame, and I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, we do, it's up in a display case, and we got it given to the Hall of Fame anonymously, we don't know where it came from. <clears throat> she said, well, imagine that. Let me tell you the story about that. The family story is John Spain's saddle was stolen after he won it. And according to what she told me, I'm just, this is just, I'll say hearsay, but according to what she told me, they, they stole the silver, put it in a bag, and buried it on the Roundup ground someplace. And then as they tried to investigate and determine what was going on. Somebody finally copped the plea and said, here's where the bag is, and that's where all the silver is, but one thing was missing, the cantle plate. And so the family got all the silver back for the saddle, but the cattle plate's been missing since somehow it ended up at the Pendleton Roundup and Happy Canyon Hall of Fame in the display. Now, whether that's a true story, I'm just telling you what I was told. And the, in 1911, like I said, the, the Roundup um, grounds was purchased, permanent facility was, took shape, it was um, outfitted to seat 15,000 originally and then enlarged in 1912 to accommodate 21,000 people. Currently you can sit in the Roundup um, stands around 17,000 people. Yes. So maybe you guys can help me, but um, Jackson Sundown was on Chief was with Chief Joseph when he fled to Idaho. Isn't that correct? I have heard that. Yes. And he had to um, stay away from the Umatilla Indian Reservation for many years because they might might have because they recaptured were, him, they so were to speak. To round up those Indians, and then 
Yep. Yeah. Can I interject a little bit here? Please? Absolutely, Matt. Um, Basically, that last go-round is what made Pendleton famous, and George Fletcher and Jackson, I think, were both inducted in 69 at the first In the first year of the... George, uh, John Spain, uh, who actually won the trophy, did not go into the Hall of Fame until just, I'm going to say, uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Yep. When I was on the... On the, on board, the board, yep. That's, that's when we actually inducted the guy that won the trophy. <laughs> Years afterwards, but, but that the the other two were they, put in sooner than that. Into the Hall of Fame, but, but the, the three of them made the publicity for the Pendleton Roundup that put Pendleton on the map. Yep. Anyway, and then and what I the the last go round is a Ken Kesey book, but there's actually been if you're interested in reading that history. So Ken's is you know fiction, but with Nonfiction in it. There's a gentleman by the name of Rod Steiger that wrote what that wrote a book, and it's called Red, Black, and White, or something like that. And that's another book about um, that happening. And there's actually a, a lady that um, the name of the book is Letter Buck. I'm almost sure it's a children's book that's based on the same thing. And is um, emphasizes George Fletcher's um, participation in that event Why and content. Spain wasn't inducted until years later. Why do why do what why do we why would we think that Spain wasn't inducted until years later? I would say partly because George, obviously, a town favorite. Oh yeah, he would. I, I never had the opportunity to meet him, but I have talked to several people. Have you? Did you I ever? Have a, Betty Francher, my neighbor across the Yes, really. Betty. Betty was good friends with him, and the stories you'd hear about George, he was just just his personality alone would could potentially generate him being into the Hall of Fame, from what I. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, he was that kind of a character. Yes, they brought the stock, just like, yeah, just, just like one of your Walla Walla people that's actually got a small display here in this museum, the Drumheller family, that also brought stock to the Pendleton Roundup. And um, George, I believe, Drumheller, was on the Pendleton Roundup board of directors for like 20 years. That was before term limits. Now there's term limits. You can only serve eight years on the Pendleton Roundup Board of Directors. Um, Becky already talked to you about the Happy Canyon and the Indian Pageant, but it was first held on Main Street. And now it's um, down next to the Roundup Grounds in the Happy Canyon um, arena that's right behind the Pendleton Convention Center. Um, and then this is back to these forward-thinking people. 1924, the Pendleton Roundup decided that they needed a logo. So they commissioned this gentleman by the name of Wallace Smith, who was a famous journalist, and actually kind of got himself in trouble because he was an author of a book that was banned by the U.S. Postal Service to be shipped. And I can't remember, it's got this strange, like, French, French word names, but basically, he, he worked in Chicago in journalism, and then he and a friend, he illustrated, a friend wrote stuff about for the book, and it was con considered to be pornographic. And if you look at it, you know, it doesn't even match what pornographic is in this day and age. But he, he, he basically lost his job in journalism with, I think it was the, whatever the main newspaper was in Chicago, and then started to make his way west and ended up in Pendleton and did some articles for the Oregonian newspaper out of Portland and, and not only articles but illustrations. So they commissioned him to create the letter, to, to create a logo. He named it Letter Buck. It is the famous bucking horse that you see, but Letter Buck was added, he, he called it that because Letter Buck had always been a term of the Pendleton Roundup from day one, even in 1910. And um, 
he was paid $125 to create that logo. Now talk about forward-thinking people. That logo today, both the image of letter buck, the bucking horse, and the um, term letter buck were officially um, copyrighted in 1925. And now it's trademarked, and the Pendleton Roundup and its association with Pendleton Whiskey, because they own the trademark, collect somewhere in the neighborhood of about $2 million a year in royalties, which they're allowed to do because they are a nonprofit organization. So another thing that added economic stimulus to keep the Pendleton Roundup alive and the city of Pendleton. And then in 1933, the Northwestern Frontier Exhi Exhibition Association disbanded and sell sold its assets to the Roundup Association, a, a newly formed nonprofit organization, and they sold membership shares at $10 where there was 500 available, and it was, and it was again, to keep the roundup going. What was, what was going on in 1933? Depression. 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 The roundup associate, the exhibition association, if you read the minutes, and we have the minutes in the Hall of Fame from day one, for both the roundup and the Happy Canyon in 1913. But if you read the minutes, it talks about how they were in kind of economic despair. And that they reformed themselves got new people that were interested in, in creating economic viability, plus, I'll, I'll say, I think they're hand in glove um, supporting and promoting the Western lifestyle that um, this new organization, the Roundup Association, was formed, and that's what exists today. Yes, Matt. And then, and then, just to point out, so this is September 29th, 1910. This is the headline on the East Oregonian. There's Letter Buck, first coined with the original Roundup. This, um, just to demonstrate, in the um, archives of the Pendleton Roundup, we have, and Happy Canyon Hall of Fame, we have a back room of archives that people use for a lot of research. And this is one of the le this is the ledger in which they paid, um, and I think that's uh, October. No, it's February. February twelfth, they paid Wallace Smith, and if I had the full ledger up there, the hundred and twenty-five dollars for that um, rendition. Did, did Wallace do the painting that's in the lobby of the Hall of This, my understanding is, this is the original. There were variations of it. I know a few people that have variations of it hanging in their homes, but this is supposedly the one that hangs in the and hangs in the Hall of Fame that was the original on which everything was based after 1925. So the 500 shares of stock, where are they today? They're still in the hands of the original. Yeah, of sorts. I mean, some of them got passed down to family members. They actually increased the amount of stock that could be issued to 1500 over time. $10. It's not allowed to generate because you can't, you can't resell it. In the terminology of the statutes of the state of Oregon, there's a little bit of an arm wrestle over this, but in the terminology of the assets, I mean, of the, of the legalese of the state of Oregon, because the Roundup Association was always a nonprofit, that they had the stock had no par value. It was becoming a, in your terms, member. And you become you, you have voting rights as a member stockholder at stockholder meetings for for 
anything that they want to do major, like change the Articles of Incorporation or the bylaws, and to place individuals on the board of directors. Ten is a tough ticket. Yes. I, when I was on Happy Canyon, I didn't get invited to a roundup stockholders meeting. Well, wait a minute, we're we're buddies here. I Not a stockholder. It took thirteen years before my name came back. <laughs> where you got to buy a piece of stock. <laughs> and then continuing on, um, just a few things that, are, that you know about that if you've been to the Roundup or have heard about. So the, the, the royalty on their galloping e entry didn't necessarily jump the rail yet. Back in that day, the rail was still wood, but that's, that's what we feel based on minutes and other information, was the first galloping entry of the royalty into the Roundup Arena. In 1939, um, bucking chutes were added. Most people think they were there forever, but they really weren't because they used to do what they called snub bucking, put a blindfold on a horse, have a rider next to that horse holding it. The contestant would get on, they'd tear the blindfold off and release the halter, and they'd go bucking across the arena, but they, they added the bucking chutes in 1939, and snub bucking kind of kept up for a little while, but generally speaking, it was the end of the snub bucking exhibition, and, a, exhibition event. Yes. And so that coined the phrase, Pendleton, where the chutes are made of wood and the men are made of iron. <laughs> is one that you see thrown around in Pendleton. 1940. Here's another one of those events that I think shapes a view of Pendleton and why the Roundup and I would offer the Happy Canyon are successful. In 1940, um, the grandstands, wooden grandstands for the Pendleton Roundup burnt to the ground. And um, underneath those grandstands actually were all the rolling stock, they call it, the old wagons and buggies of the Pendleton Roundup, and they burned up in the fire too. So if you go to the Western Hope Parade today, and all those wagons and buggies that you see that are in the Roundup, if they haven't been brought by a private party or provided by the Pendleton Roundup, the Happy Canyon has a few, but they had, from 1940 till now, they've had to rebuild that collection. And I've been told, I can't remember what the number is now, but it's a hundred at least, I think. It's been inventoried several times to figure out its value because some are, right, and the Pendleton Roundup um, Foundation actually owns them. And, and, but the other part of this 1940 thing is that they rebuilt the current South Grandstands, the one that's made in co out of concrete, okay? They, they started it and rebuilt it, and in 23 days it was built absent the roof to hold Pendleton, the Pendleton Roundup in that September. Now think about trying to build something anything. today. Anything. <laughs> the committee went to, to uh, Mac McCormick, McCormick Construction, and could you build a wooden grandstand for us? And he says, why would you do that? It just burnt, just burnt down. down. <laughs> and, and so he got a cement plant out of Portland, the steel and the, the sign out of Portland, had railroaded up to Pendleton in 23 days. He, they had two shifts, 10 hour shifts, basically working around the clock, two 10 hour shifts a day. And in, in the 23 days, they put up that concrete grandstand. It's still standing there. Yep. Um, and today, you couldn't get a permit to do that. <laughs> you can't get a permit to wash it. Um, and then I just wanted to point out 42. So this talks about the civic pride and, and want to keep something that was very good for Pendleton in all kinds of ways, especially economically, was worth doing that in 23 days. 42 and 43, World War II, no Pendleton Roundup. And again, of course, in 2020, due to the pandemic.
This is a picture of the fire that was taken the evening that it was going up in flames. They, um, somebody was smoking in the stands, they think. Was a uh, women, no, I think it's softball. Was softball. Women's softball. No, I'm not going to blame it on it. <laughs> but, it, but they thought it was somebody smoking in the stands and just dropped their cigarette. This doesn't show up real good for you, but this is just a half... I, I tried to find where I found this and take a better picture, but this just talks about all the assets that were transferred from the, from the Exhibition Association to the Roundup Association. So this just gives you another, other ideas, but here it is, which I think is just in, very intriguing. One copyrighted bucking horse for 100 bucks. <laughs> think how much that's worth today. T-shirts. <laughs> Every other thing you can think, plus a whiskey. Huh? Buckles. Buckles. Anything. I'm running out of time, but I'll, I'll try to get through this quick. So the year's in motion, 34 to 2003. They, they did hold a try in, in August, and they did hold a night show one time. And they had paramutual betting. There used to be horse races at, on the track at the Pendleton Roundup. For those of you that haven't been there, it's basically a quarter mile dirt track around a grass infield that is also used to play high school football on um, when Roundup isn't going on. And essentially, the, the arena hasn't always been grass, but it's never been any more than dirt, weeds, and now beautiful green grass. I wanted to add this in. Oh, and they added lights, and that's what helped in the 50s. A little bit later, I can't, uh, I don't know if I put it up here. Oh yeah, 51, they added the turf, and then they put the lights on, I think in like 55 or 56 to allow them to play night football. Um, Main Street Cowboys, I don't want you to forget that organization. The story goes like this. Pendleton ground up, created, to support um, the Western lifestyle and create economic opportunity for the, for the city of Pendleton. Happy Canyon Night Show, Roy Rayleigh, in part to promote the cultural traditions of the tribal members, but the other sideline to it was they had too dang many people in town and they were tearing the town up at night. And they wanted something for them to do, so they created the Happy Canyon Night Show, which starts at 7.45 every night, to get them back to watching something instead of in the bars or in the speakeasies and tearing up everything. And then along came the Main Street Cowboys because they said, you know, you got the Roundup, it's during the day, you got the Happy Canyon at night, we want to squeeze in the Main Street thing uh, for the merchants to get business on Main Street. So that's how Main Street cowboys were created. And now you go to Pendleton during Roundup Week, Main Street's closed. They, they, what is the greatest free show on earth or something like that is their motto. And so they came along. And so now it's Roundup Week with three entities that basically support what's going on in Pendleton. Again, I don't want to over, over highlight it, economically, money. Schools are closed, yep, yep, that's a big deal. And then 57, the North Grandstands, if you've ever been to Pendleton, the ones on the north side of the arena were built, and uh, CBS airs the um, Pendleton Roundup uh, nationwide, and it was on like 250 some affiliates across the United States. And then in 1958, important, for everybody because they always ask, when's Pendleton? It's the second full week in September and it started in 1958 to be that way. For those of you that are familiar with the letter buck room, it also opened, but it was a private party area to first start out with and then it became a public bar later during roundup week. 69, thanks. Um, 1960, golden anniversary, the Dallas Cowboys played the Los Angeles Rams inside Pendleton Arena on the grass. 
1962, another they air on the Roundup airs on ABC's Wide World of Sports, and then in '69 again as well. They replaced the wooden rail with PVC pipe in '64. In 1969, the who I'm representing here tonight, the Pendleton Roundup and Happy Canyon Hall of Fame was created, and is considered to be one of the first Hall of Fames created for a professional rodeo in the United States. And its intent was to preserve the, ha the Pendleton Roundup and Happy Canyon history. And again, our archives in the back, beyond our collections that you see when you walk through the museum, are highly uh, wanted for research. Just like I kind of showed you the history a little bit about Wallace Smith and the painting, there's all kinds of stuff in the minutes and. I mean, we've got programs from day one for both events to current, all that, and contestant lists, everything with regards to the Pendleton Roundup. And then, just a little tidbit, the Roundup actually got its first liquor license for themselves. Prior to that, they weren't able to get a liquor license because they weren't in operation full year, and the letter buck room, and they used the Roundup Room and Pilot Rock to secure their liquor license every year until 79. Forward thinking, I think it's paid off now. I call this the years in motion. The 70, 85, the 70, 75th anniversary, the Mounted Cowboy Band, which you may be familiar with in parades, had been dormant, if you will, since 1923, and it was brought back. Um, the leathers for the court, the queen and the princesses, returns after being gone since the 1930s, and they were more elaborate. And again, there's kind of a, a, a Walla Walla connection again. Andrea Beck, Cloven Charmaine's daughter, was the queen of the 1985 Roundup, and the leathers, um, the idea was created by Doug and Heather Corey. Heather Corey worked in Walla Walla, I can't remember for whom, somebody, and um, Shirley Dickerson, some of you may know that name, as an artist and a, and a leather person in Walla Walla, is who they recruited to do the pattern to create the leathers. And then the kickoff concert that the that, there ha that they have on the first Saturday of Roundup Week was added, and then the PBR event was added in 99, and now it's called the PRCA Extreme Bull event, and that's on Monday and Tuesday of Roundup Week. What does that stand for? Oh, PBR, Professional Bull Riders Association. Derek Obama, for all you people that know <laughs> Walla Walla names and then PRCA, Professional Rodeo Cowboy Association. They got kind of upset that PBR was taking all the action, so they tried to create a similar thing called the Extreme Bulls. Who makes the money from that? The Pendleton Roundup or an outside entity? A Pendleton Roundup and Happy Canyon. This is, this is a combined event. So the, the net 50 /50. proceeds are shared 50-50. first year and this year is the second year. They get the top, this year it's the top 24, bull, top 24 bull riders in the PRCA, plus they're adding two wild cards this year. 2003 to 2010, Pendleton Whiskey was created. You can't talk about Pendleton without talking about that. I already told you the over a million dollars in royalty that they get paid, it's a life stream to the Pendleton Roundup um, on an annual basis. Um, and they protect that, the Roundup protects that trademark. <laughs> Originally, it was Hood River Distillers that created the whiskey and came to the Pendleton Roundup. And then um, it has since sold to a company called Proximo that's the United States um, agent of Jose Cuervo tequila. 
the Jose Cuervo family owns Proximo and now Proximo owns the brand Pendleton Whiskey, but Pendleton Whiskey is still distilled in Hood River, Oregon <laughs> by Hood River Distillers. It's a little confusing, but it works. Um, in two, yes, sir. No, they get the. It is considered a Canadian whiskey because the base comes from a wholesaler in Canada, but it's it's, it's distilled. You got to be careful because to be able to claim that it's uh, this in the United States and created by Hood River now Proximo, it's actually a distilling process they go through, and the claim to fame is. They use water off of Mount Hood from the Hood River off the glaciers to, to do the distilling. And that's why you can go to, that's, before they sold it, that's why you could go to their distillery um, store in Hood River and actually buy it and taste it. Can't do that now because they aren't the owners. Well, the, the base, is that an alcoholic base or is it a grain base? Um, it's a grain base, but, but it's alcohol too when it comes. It's fermented already. It, they, it is fermented. Yeah, they do it in barrels up there. Believe me, I shouldn't even share this. It'll take away all the, uh, the, the romance with Pendleton whiskey. If you go do a tour back before, and maybe they still do it, it gets shipped to them in railroad cars, <laughs> like oil tankers, but it's full of whiskey. And I wrote down, you know, the little flame, I'll just tell you, sites are a little flame thing on the side of trucks and stuff that tells you what hazard it is. I can't remember the number now, but I wrote it down so I'd know when I was seeing whiskey go down the railroad tracks or in a truck. <laughs> 2009, just before the 100th year of the Pendleton Roundup, uh, the Roundup Association um, did a bought into a 13,000, I mean a 13 million dollar renovation to create the Centennial West Grandstands, which replaced the old Sun Bowl wooden breacher, bleachers, and then the statue um, was put out front along with um, what they call Centennial Plaza. So it, another one of those things, even though it's more current than let's say 1910, things going on, people thinking ahead, trying to figure out what would make the Pendleton Roundup last for another 100 years. A side story to the Centennial West Grandstands is the Cheyenne and Pendleton have a, a relationship, um, sort of like Pendleton has with Walla Walla because in the early days, stock was traded around through all the rodeos. So a lot of the stock from Cheyenne, because they're older, what are they, in 124th year or something like that, would get shipped to Pendleton to be reused. And um, the... So there's that relationship, and when, when Cheyenne celebrated their 100th year, the following year they actually saw a decrease in people, spectators, coming to watch the, Cal the Cheyenne Frontier Days. Pendleton, um, I used to know the numbers more explicitly, but obviously the 100th year was the banner year for the most people at the Pendleton Roundup over the four days. Um, but the decrease from the first year to the second year was hardly anything. And it has stayed pretty static, and which is different than other rodeos have experienced with their 100th year. What year is this? This, um, this is the 100th year because they re what we did was we repeat, repeated the Western Hope Parade and the Serpentine inside the arena. So the Western Hope Parade actually went east and then came back west and all the people came in here and I counted this at one time when everybody was in here because I was the publicity director for the Pendleton Roundup at the time. There's something like 300, I can't remember the number exactly, 350 people on horseback in the arena because the parade came back in there and just bang. Yeah, oh yeah, it was, and no wrecks. That was, the, that was the thing that was most important. 
I just, I just threw this in because it's one of my favorite pictures of the bucking horse. People always see it in September and stuff, but once in a while I drive by it, and I personally captured this shot after a snowstorm in Pendleton. <laughs> Not that I'm a photographer. And then, I mean, there, there are some other things in the timeline, but as the, you know, the early years is what really think, I think helped shape Pendleton. There hasn't been much since the Centennial West Grandstand and the renovations done to attract people. They've tried different things, like adding breakaway roping and things like that, but nothing as earth-shaking as like having a whiskey or having Wallace Smith create a logo for you. But just to now, um, 2011, again, I mentioned Heather Corey earlier. She actually ended up being the first woman to serve on the Pendleton Roundup um, board of directors. She passed away midterm um, from cancer. And then the, in 2019 and 2020, the Roundup Association bought what was across the street was an Albertson's grocery store that went defunct, bought that property, and put in their new administration building. Uh, to add to this just a little bit, we as one of the family members, the Hall of Fame, actually did our thing in 20, 2006. And so the three cor on one corner you have the Roundup Stadium, on another corner you have Roy Rayleigh Park, named after one of the most well, the first president of the, of the Pendleton Roundup and the first and the creator of the Happy Canyon, and then the Hall, Pendleton Roundup and Happy Canyon Hall of Fame on the other corner, and now this this sealed the four corner deal. Um, I'm I'm biased, as you can tell, but for me, that's the hub, that corner of 11th. 12, uh, 12th, 11th, 12th and Court in, in Pendleton is the hub of everything that makes all the other spokes go out, all the other things that go, but that's what, in, in my view, helps keep Pendleton alive. And then that's the building if you haven't seen it. And they did a little thing and added a Dutch Bros coffee thing that it's, God, the line's always long. I just, I'm not a coffee drinker. And then I can't do this. I'll give credit to Matt. Thank you for adding some information, Matt. But here's where I got some of this in case you're interested. There was a book published by the East Oregonian in, that covered um, its first hundred years. And it's, it's an interesting book to read. I won't say it's the most captivating book, but it does share the history. Um, there was a gentleman by the name of Virgil Rupp that was a newspaper um, journalist, and he, he wrote this book, Letter Buck, A History of the Pendleton Roundup, and I think it covers up to like 1985. It might be a few years after that. And then another book was created by the, out of initiative of the, of the Roundup Association, Roundup at 100, so it talks about the first 100 years and it was um, authored by Michael Bales and Ann Terry Hill. And Ann Terry Hill has um, a long history um, as a family person with regards to the Pendleton Roundup and Happy Canyon. Her dad was president of the Roundup. Uh, her brother was president. For president of the Happy Canyon. Uh, not president, on the board. On the board, and she yes. Was the queen of the Roundup. Yes. Awesome. And, the, and she has since passed away. And then I already mentioned Vic Cassera in this book, Rivoli, which I, is, is very intriguing. It's a big read, but it it's, talks about the history. And then, of course, the collections of the Pendleton Roundup and Happy Canyon Hall of Fame. So that's where all that comes from. Now, I'm going to make this statement to close out. If you haven't been to Roundup, don't ask me what it's like, because my answer is going to be, you got to go. There is no other way than to figure out what the Pendleton Roundup's all about, but you gotta go. And even though you live here in Walla Walla, you ought to think about staying in Pendleton with the 60 to 70,000 extra people that come to a 13,000 person 
city to enjoy Roundup Week and look at the tents and RVs and everybody's nook and corner. Pendleton used to have a COT, C-O-T program, where they rented out cots to homeowners and, and, and the, the cot and the mattress. And then because of fumigation issues and all that kind of stuff, they did away with that program, but that was a way that they, they'd make those available so people could have other people living in their homes with them during Roundup Week. Um, and I would say the same for the, for the Happy Canyon. I have a friend that grew up in Bly, Oregon, and he now lives in Pendleton. He has somewhere between, he says, 15 to 25 people come to his house and stay in his backyard during Roundup Week. They do not go to the Pendleton Roundup at all, unless they happen to get somebody say, here's a ticket. They go to the Happy Canyon Night Show, and they go to Main Street, and that's their fun for that week. So that in Pendleton, there's, there's a conglomeration of events to attract anybody and what their wishes and wants might be with regards to what I'll call Western heritage, Western culture. And that's it. And I am over time, but I will if there's some questions that came up that you didn't get a chance to ask. Yes, sir. Will they ever reinstate the stagecoach race? There has been discussion about it, but it's sort of like the wild horse races. And, and I'll be honest with you, one event um, that they still have in the Roundup Arena that's a sanctioned P professional rodeo cowboy event, steer tripping, also known as single steer roping event.